So what we're going to do is look at some good news here in terms of how God actually de de designed marriage. So we're going to go to Genesis uh, chapter 2 with that. So, so we looked at whose we are, and we'll see that who we are is who, whose we really are. We are, we are bonded beings. So in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 1, I apologize, uh, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, uh, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for helping us in our first session. And now, Lord, we need an infilling of your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to each other. Uh, Father, to give us endurance um, on this Saturday morning. And we thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to meet together. And now as we go into who we are based on whose we are in you, may we see the good news of Genesis 2 and how a lot of this has not changed even though sin has entered the world. So may we go back to the basics in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. So the question I want to ask is, how did the first husband and wife impact how we became bonded beings? You know, there's a lot of research right now on betrayal. And it actually will say, betrayal bonds. So when we're betrayed, it's actually a bond that is betrayed. Because we are bonded beings. When a mother gives birth to a baby, the moment that happens, oxytocin is released at the base of her brain. And what happens is, the, uh, that's what makes her dilate and then have the child. But then, interesting enough... That is what brings in milk in the milk ducts as well. And when she's breastfeeding the baby from the right orbital frontal cortex, so from the right eye to the right eye, she's literally downloading love, research has shown. Isn't that amazing how God has designed that? She's downloading love from right eye to right eye. Remember, the prefrontal cortex in terms of the left sphere is not fully developed, but the right is online. So she's online, or the baby's online with mom. That's key to understand. And then she holds the baby, and then when you, and it's interesting, I used to talk to all my kids when actually they were in Renee's stomach. And so I put my face in her stomach and talk away, and Renee was very uh, kind because I would talk a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but it's interesting, I left for when Stevie was first born, he, uh, he was three months, and I had to go for six weeks to the States. Um, and I went to the States, came back, and I didn't know if he was going to connect. He didn't go to any other man, and when I came, she was actually breastfeeding at the airport, and I sat next to her, and I went, Stevie, oh, what are you doing? And he pulls his head away, and he turns around. He remembered my voice. There's a wiring that's there, and that's like, it's called a pair bonding. That's why they often say, oh, no, no, the babies only go to, 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 uh, to moms. No, a father's involvement from day one is absolutely critical. Does that make sense? Because that pair bonding is key. Well, we are bonded beings. We were never designed to be on our own. Look at COVID. How many people shut down? How many people felt hurt because they felt on their own? We're not designed to be on our own. A lot of people will die of broken hearts, even in marriage, because they feel isolated on their own. So how did God design that? Let's go back to God's design. Well, it says that God created the man in his image. The word image, remember, the image is not the original, but it is created from the original to present the original. That's the point. God created us in his image. It's not the original. We are to represent the original. So what's the implications for marriage? Well, God designed a man and a woman to be exclusive image bearers designed to represent his purposes. That's the first thing you've got to understand. And in premarital counseling, that's key. We are not here for ourselves. We are here to represent who, whose we are in our marriage, both uniquely, but we're to represent his purposes. What do you want from us, Lord? Next, 
God created humankind to not only uh, 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 represent his purposes, but to resemble his character. It says that's, that word likeness means that which is really resembling the character of the original. It resembles the character. So God is love. We're to love. God is mercy. We're to show mercy. God forgives. We're to forgive. God um, is patient, where to be patient. And you get where we're going. God is gentle, where to be gentle. And so in marriage, marriage is the perfect relationship for a man and a woman as two distinct and diverse people to resemble God's characteristics to one another. All of us have strengths and all of us have weaknesses. Patience is not a, a strength of mine. Macrothume. So I've had to have the Lord really work in my life. So I don't ask for patience. I ask for circumstances that give me patience. And notice how the fruit of the Spirit, by the way, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, they, we, we have to have all nine in us. I have a, an assessment that I give out to couples to look at the fruit of the Spirit to see where they are, where their spouse is, and how they might sabotage that, but how to get back into finding that kind of uh, connection again. So we resemble God. And remember... Your marriage and my marriage is the number one evangelistic tool for the world. People are impressed when, especially unsafe people, when you say, yeah, we fail in our marriage, but God helped us to get it right. That's an evangelistic tool right there. God created humankind to reflect his glory, not only represent him and resemble him, but reflect his glory. Just as the sun is the source of the light, light is the reflection of the sun, so the creature reflects the creator. What does Romans 3.23 say? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We fail to represent God as we should. But God says in Isaiah 53.7, I created you for my glory. We represent that original. Marriage is an incredible opportunity to reflect who God is and who you are as a couple in relationship to God Again, a wonderful evangelistic tool to a broken world. God, we've moved four times in two years since we, we stayed in there, uh, because we were moving full-time to South Africa, uh, but uh, we were busy adopting, and that fell through, and so we had to wait, and then COVID hit, et cetera. Um, and so we had no house. We'd sold everything, because that's how we were funding South Africa uh, from 2009 to 2020. And so we had to stay. So we had to move four times. But one of the places we moved to, and every time we moved, uh, like it was Westridge, and we said, Lord, may we have a, a, we both went on our knees, Renee and I, may we have an impact on our neighbors. It was insane how God let that happen. Our neighbor was doing his fence, so I helped him build it. Uh, I just carry things. I'm no good at buildings, but uh, he's a builder, so you know, uh, I did that with him. And, and then we got talking. We had a barbecue. Next thing, as spring hit, uh, the next neighbor came over. We got talking to them. The, the guy across the road was awesome. He was a drug dealer. It was amazing. So I went and did his lawn. God picked up all the needles because they were all over the place. And I got chatted to him, you know, and we, we had a great chat. I said, just don't bring your guys across the road there or we'll chat again. And he said, no, no, no problem. So we, we had a great chat. Um, and it, it was just amazing to, to meet everybody. And then one day they all got together and said, hey, you guys want to come out? We came out and they actually held a barbecue for us. None of them knew the Lord. But the point is we were able to be an influence for Christ publicly there. It was awesome. So it's amazing who you can share Christ with. Every morning I get up, every, every, sorry, on a Sunday morning I'll get up, so I say, Lord, may I share Christ with at least 10 to 15 people this week. It's incredible the amount of people God will bring in front of you if you ask for that. It doesn't always work out 15, but how can I plant the seed of the gospel? Not necessarily preach at someone, but plant the seed of the gospel. Renee asked the same thing. To me, that's key because we reflect God's, God's image God created humankind with a distinct respective roles, male and female. See there in red, a distinctive diversity. There was an equality and a dignity, though. The woman and the man were separate. They both have distinct roles to play. That's a seminar all on its own because it's awesome. Because the, how God designed marriage and uh, Derek Kidner said this, the words male and female coming at this juncture have far-reaching implications as Jesus made it plain when he coupled them 
uh, with uh, Genesis 2.24 to make the two sayings, the twin pillars of marriage, Mark 10, because he said, this was not so from the beginning. God made them male and female. That's what Jesus said. To define humanity as bisexual is to make each partner the complement of the other and to anticipate the New Testament doctrine of the sexes, spiritual, spiritual quality, equality, all being one. So just like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are unique, distinct beings, but they are one in essence. So marriage was the picture of that. And you know what? That's found beautifully in what? Now this might be a shock to many of you. A man has a penis, a woman has a vagina. And the point of those two is more than just anatomical. It's a joining together. That's why sex before marriage doesn't work. When's the last time a church had a topic on that? Talked about, thanks be to God we have a pastor who preaches on this, but sex itself is the consummation. So when two people are getting to know one another, etc., that's why you don't have sex before marriage, because sex is kind of the bow. It's the consummation of everything. So when you come together, it's more than anatomical. You're saying something profound. Isn't it interesting? you got to be naked, and you got to become one. And it's more than just for procreation. It's for pleasure as well. What's the lovemaking manual of the Bible? Song of Songs. When's the last time you studied that with your spouse? It's a key book. Actually, it's right in the middle of the Bible. He wrote the Song of Songs because he said, I messed up in marriage. You don't have to. He wrote Proverbs, I messed up as a dad. You don't have to. And Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, I messed up in business. You don't have to. Wow. Three books in the Bible written because somebody messed up. Nobody's got it together. And if you don't get this, men, this is key. If you don't get this, men, that's why your wives will feel used, objectified. And that's why it's so critical that we get this right. We get this right. A beautiful distinction. God creates humankind to rule God's world. God made us king, uh, ambassadors, kings and queens and viceroys to rule God's word his way, but he did it in a servant leadership capacity. When you, you cannot study the Old and the New Testament and not see that it's not just a servant, but a servant leader. A leader influences. A servant comes up under and doesn't look for his own rights or her own rights. And God designed us to be servant leaders. Where's that modeled, by the way? In marriage. That we serve one another. We influence one another. And you are your kids' best premarital counselors. Because they'll go, oh yeah, this is how work marriage works. This is how marriage works. What's the implication for marriage? Rulership is always subjected to the role of service under God. Dominion is a form of worship. When we do not follow God's word and rule for ourselves, this creates a division in marriage. We have to realize God designed us to rule but it is to serve him. It's always under him. It's always serving one another. Number six, God creates humankind with the ability to retrace their histories. I was going to take this one out, but I, I didn't, because 10 times this word toledoth comes up in the book of Genesis. In fact, Genesis is connected 10 times with this word toledoth, which basically means this is your family line. That's what it means. This is your family line. So in Genesis, this is the family line of sin, Genesis 3. So it's this is the family line. So why is that a big deal? Well, the Bible teaches that curses can run how many generations? Guess what epigenetics teaches? So everybody has a DNA uh, gene expression. There's a pair. Uh, every a couple have a pair. One is in the wife, one's in the, in, in the husband. And when they come together, that is shared with the next generation. Trauma can go over four generations. Abuses, hurt, pain, different ways that we do things can spill over generations. Did you know that? Research shows that now. Then nobody argues that anymore. Well, the Bible said it first. There are curses. Now, what it also says is, if the father ate sour grapes, the son's teeth are not on edge. What he means that the father, the son is not responsible for the father's sin. Does that make sense? 
for it is the soul that sins that dies, uh, Ezekiel 18. However, you'll see kings will say, and he did as more sin than his father. He did more sin than his father. So certain sins can carry on and perpetuate if we don't nip it now. And you say, oh yeah, that's just with men. No, that's with wives as well. You can, you can spill over generations if we're not careful. And that's important to understand. God was resolute that humankind was formed as a living what? Soul. Why is that such a big deal? Because God created humankind not just with a body, but with a soul. We are a soul in a body. The body's the vehicle, but the body does not make up the person. That is opposite to what we're taught today. You look at TikTok. You look at social media. A person is often judged on their body image. That's a fact. And you might say, well, that's not an issue for me. Really? The research says something different, and so does the Word of God. It is a big deal for us, both with men and women. Our bodies, we often compare. We, often, we actually can be depressed over the shame we feel about our bodies. And yet we are a soul, and that's key for mental health, by the way. If we realize we're a soul, the soul is the person. The body will perish. You know what I realized as I got older? Things sag a bit. I am so glad I never got a tattoo on my chest of a smiley face because it would be sad right now. You've got to be careful with these tattoos, eh? But wow, things, things go wrong. Your body breaks down. You get sick, right? You can get diabetes. You can get sicknesses. Things break down. But our soul... And why is that so important in the Bible? Because the word for soul, your mind and your heart literally come out of your soul. The soul is who you are. Our thinking and our feeling comes out of our soul. So if the soul isn't correct with God, if God doesn't own the soul, we're done. The reason we think, strategize, desire, will, decide, feel, express is because of our soul. But after Genesis 3, it becomes wants, demands, coveting, comparing, consuming, longing, so that when we sinned, boy, did it ever affect the soul. The soul that sins dies, Ezekiel 18 teaches us, the soul. What did Jesus say? Don't be afraid of him who can just kill, just kill the body. Be afraid of him, and this is in Matthew 10, 28, be afraid of him who can kill the body but send the soul to hell. It's the soul. And then you're given a brand new body in hell. You're given a brand new body in heaven. So we want to make sure that our soul is right before Lord. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man? In, in Mark 8, 34 onwards, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? When sin entered the world, the soul becomes corrupt, which influences the heart and mind. That is key to grasp. You'll see why that's important in our next session. God created man to, and this is key, God created man to be responsible for service and stewardship of his world and his word. Genesis 2.15a, the Lord God took the man and strategically, that's what the word put there means, put him in the sphere of the garden of blessing, of delight, to worship him, work it, and to keep it, to serve him and to protect it. That's what that means. Adam was strategically placed the Hebrew word for put in verse 8 is to appoint. So God appointed the man. He set him in place, but then he strategically gave him two things. I want you to work for me and worship me. I want you to protect my word, protect my world. And anybody I give you, he gave that to the man. And what did he say? He commanded the man in Genesis 2.16. The word command was given sometime before he created the woman. The word command has the idea of an, a, a catalyst for ongoing maturity, for growth and development. That's why we have commands. It's not just do and don't. It tells us something. So when you're driving your car, when I first got here in this country, it's crazy. I was on Coldwater Road, and I was pulled out uh, outside Coldwater Cold Road, Road for, I was doing a 60 and a 40. There was no 40 sign there, but the police officer stopped me and said, you know, you got a weird accent. Yeah, I'm from South Africa. He says, go back. No, I didn't. He says, uh, uh, 
well, how come you're speeding? Well, I didn't know. You know, he said, well, do you have a driving license? You know, he gave me my South African one. <laughs> he said, okay, come with me. So he drove me all the way down to Lackley Street. He said, you might need to sit here. And uh, um, he said, because I know some of you South African guys drive pretty quick. So and I said, but I, with all fairness, I didn't know. He said, yeah, just because you didn't know doesn't mean the, the, the law was not there. The law says you drive 40 in this zone. So even I, would, I was ignorant of it, but it didn't mean that the law didn't exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, in South Africa, it wasn't good. I, it took me nine times to get my driving license. Yeah, I know. They, gave, they actually gave me a gold watch for long service afterwards. <laughs> I didn't tell the officer that, by the way. Uh, command, the word command means truth that guides someone purposefully towards an end. That's literally what the word command means. N telos towards an end. So a command is God is moving you and I towards an end. So when he says, do not commit adultery, he's moving us towards an end. So you have the permission and the privilege and the permission to enjoy your wife. Do not commit adultery. Don't go after someone else. So it provides and it protects. So what's the maturity? If I see a woman and you want, you want to lust with it? No, stop. Be accountable. Go home. Admit it and connect with one another. Not necessarily sexually, but talk and pray. That's the idea. See what it does? That's what a command does. So I mature. If I know I'm not to do something, have you ever driven down the road and you saw flashing lights of a police officer's car and you get, like, you get this, <laughs> you check your, well, that's your conscience. Your conscience is telling you that. Everybody knows good and wrong, and that's what a command does. What's the implications for marriage? Well, whose word do we follow? Whose word do we follow? Do, and do you use the word of God when it's convenient? So you pull out a verse to make a point to your spouse? That's not helpful. What is helpful is reading the Bible and then going to your spouse and saying, man, God has convicted me of this. i got to change this attitude. Now, that's helpful. That, 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 moves, that moves God. God created the man and the woman to be, sorry, created the woman, and this is phenomenal, to be a reasoning complementary counterpart, and that's in the language. Then the Lord said in chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. The man, named, uh, uh, and the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the, uh, uh, of the heavens and the beasts of the field, but for Adam there was not a helper fit for him. That word helper is critical. Because notice, inside him, and Pastor Paul Carter said this, it's, God created man strategically deficient. I love that phrase, strategically deficient. There was no sin, but he knew that he had to have a helpmate. There was a deep deficiency, a deep need. He was alone. And by the, this is a fact. When a man loses his wife through death, men are more likely to marry within the first six months to a year than a woman is. Isn't that interesting? Statics, uh, the stats tell us that. The research tells us that. Women will actually, they will mourn, they will grieve. And yeah, around about year three, because it takes five years to mourn a, a death. So around about year three, four, they are now going, yeah, you know what? I, I, and there's nothing wrong in then saying, I'd like to have a godly man in my life, etc. But a man will panic. And that's why, ladies, you can't mother your husband. Not helpful. One of the things I said to Renee when we first got married, you will never be my mother. Oh, my word. Now, does that mean she doesn't minister to me, etc., in ways that, I mean, I'm not a good cook. She's an amazing cook. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. She's an amazing partner. She's a, she has incredible wisdom. But it's interesting, if she died, we've already spoken about this, I would wait a good number of years, and whether I would even remarry, man, I tell you what, to date again? I don't know. Anyway, so her and I have talked about that. I, and what I do know is that I want to I, I take care of Ellie. I probably would get a nanny, probably, to, and, and to help with Ellie. But other than that, I would, I'd want to stay single. And then down the road, yes, because what I do for a living, you've got to have a very particular kind of lady who wants to serve the Lord full time. And that was huge. I made a huge mistake with Renee um, when we were first married, that's another reason she didn't show, show up at the wedding, is that I, I was very demanding. So I said, well, you, we're going to live strategically and sacrificially. 
We're never going to, you know, it doesn't matter what we earn, we're going to give away to the orphan, the widow, the poor, etc. So my heart was in the right place, but how I communicated that wasn't. So when she actually came back, she walked, I don't know how many kilometers to the shed that I was living in. She knocks on the door and she goes, don't say a word. I'm like, whoo, wow. She is one incredible woman right now. She goes, don't say a word. I'll go anywhere in the world with you. I'll never ask for a house to be built, a kitchen to be renovated, fine. But these will be my kids too, though. This will be my marriage too, not just yours. He'll be my God too, not just yours, and we'll partner together. And then she walked away. We were married two months later. No honeymoon, didn't matter. Well, actually it did later on to her because she, she told me that, but we couldn't afford it. But with everything that we've lost, here's the key. She has been a reasoning, wise woman. Proverbs 31 should not be taken lightly, ladies. And gentlemen, you should study that passage, man. Because a, any woman can become a Proverbs 31 woman. Why? Because she's strategic. She thinks. She's thinking ahead. She's taking care of orphans and widows. She's, she's planning things. And that should be studied. It's very rarely studied. Proverbs 31, 10 to 31, it should be. Because he didn't just need a physical partner, though he did need one like him. It was, it, God designed man to work interdependent with somebody who complemented him. And that's the word helper. It's the word ezer. That's the word for the Holy Spirit, ladies. That's why you can't nag us. Stop nagging. But gentlemen, if she's nagging, that tells me you, you haven't done your job because the dripping tap is a pain. But when she comes to you and says, hey, I've seen this or this or this or this about you or about us, you want to listen to that because she's the Holy Spirit. That's why, ladies, you've got to be in the Word. So when you're speaking, it's spoken by the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? It's from the Word. She was an Ezra, and you'll notice in chapter 2, verse 18, and chapter 2, verse 22, it's what they call bookends. So we know when, whenever you have a bookend in Scripture, you'll see another bookend in Genesis 6, uh, 5, and Genesis 8, uh, 21. It says that the inclination and the strategies of the heart were evil all the time, uh, all the time, sorry, and from childhood. That's bookends. Here's a bookend. Ezra, that she's the complementary counterpart, is bookended, which means that's the emphasis. So ladies, you have such a critical role. And men, and I bless your hearts and bless my heart too, we were not taught this. Nobody taught us this. Any, well, and I, well, if your dad did teach you, fantastic. I taught my boys this, but I wasn't taught this, that a woman is a precious daughter of God and a helper, a complementary counterpart. So the word suitable, notice there's a helper suitable. The word suitable suggests a person who was significantly different from him so as to contribute distinctively to his life as a counterpart, yet one who was at the same uh, essence and on the same level. Isn't that beautiful? There was no pushing down. There was a partnership there. Boy, when that works. Have you ever kissed your wife? I hope so. Have you ever kissed your husband? Notice how God anatomically designed the nose to touch the nose, the eyes, the eyes, and the mouth, the mouth. And even when you kiss, that connection, right, it's a, there's, a, there's a complementary counterpart there. And that's why you have to brush your teeth. Women was to be equal but distinct exalted and contributing in a diverse, unique, collaborative way that enriches the relationship. So the word helper and suitable carries this idea. Number one, one who co closely resembles another. You literally, to have a baby, have to have, and I just forgot the chromosomes. What's the chromosomes, Jessica, in a... Is it Y? XY? And then in a man, X? X? Anyway, thank you. Isn't that interesting? You have to have the other. You can't have a baby man on your own. And women, you can't have a baby on your own. Well, I understand the whole other way it's done today. My point is, how was it designed? 
But it's not just for sex. It's for connection. That's why a woman, one of the books I'm writing, so those 20 areas I showed you, each of them are, are a book. So I'm putting them into a book. One of them is lovemaking versus sex because a woman needs to know she's going to be made love to by being protected. A man wants sex. Neither's wrong. Neither's wrong. But that resembling the other is key. One, a helper suitable. One that has, has the same functions and characteristics as the other. A corresponding person. Even though a man and a woman are different, because they have a soul and the systems of their body work very similar in certain areas, like their heart would work the same way, the lungs work the same way. Yes, the reproduction organs work differently, but there is some similarity. One of the two parts that fit and complement the other, one that serves as a complement, and one who is a counterpart that protects, aids, helps, and supports. You ever notice when things are going well and you just want to snuggle? You're not saying anything. You're just snuggling or you're spooning. You're lying down. And there's that moment when it's really going well. There's no words. It just fits. Have you ever had that? Or have you, have you lost that? Do you remember that? We just connected. And that's why we need to go away at times. That's why we need to have date nights, so we, because it fits. You know, there's times where I look across the room, we'll be busy doing something, and Renee still takes my breath away. She still does. Because of who she is, her grace. You know, I went to my laundry basket the other day, and I just went, thank you so much for just folding my clothes, man. That is such a big deal. This has been a last two weeks has been like 16, 15 hour days. And yet to know that she's there, she says, this is how I compliment you. You're an amazing mother. Thank you for watching our kids the way you do. You know, and yet if she died, today's a good day to die. My wife and I have this saying, today's a good day to die. We had it from 1995. When she, we, she almost died in 2008 when she hit a steel pole and broke 28 bones. Um, first thing she said to me, it's a good day to die. No regrets. And that morning, her and I had prayed. The 3rd of, the 3rd of February, 2008, we had prayed that morning that we had become one another's idol. And we repented of that. And we said, God, whatever it takes. That afternoon at 4 o'clock, she's on a tube with my daughter, goes down there at the, at the golf course, and she hits the steel pole. As soon as it happened, I looked up and I went, okay, let's go. I, I knew what was going on. And it's interesting that we both got a wake-up call. God creates the ultimate romance and depth of relationship. This is beautiful. God designed the ultimate secure attachment between two people. The Lord God said in Genesis 2, 21, 22, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to, to fall upon the man. And while he slept, God took one of the ribs and closed it up its place in flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made. One author said he was the perfect surgeon. And notice he makes, doesn't build. He makes rather than builds a perfect partner. God as the great surgeon puts Adam under anesthetic in a deep sleep. Adam has no part in the woman's creation. God knows who Adam needs. Adam becomes the recipient of God's gracious provision of a partner. Even in the fall, even in sin, God knows who we need. That's key. Matthew Henry says this, The woman came out of the man's rib, not from his feet to be walked on, not from his head to be superior, but from his side to be his equal, under the arm to be protected, and next to the heart to be loved. That's one of the best descriptions of Genesis I, I have ever read, Genesis 2. Not to be walked on, not to be superior, but from his side, under his arm to be protected, and next to his heart to be loved. I've often, Renee has put her head on my chest when we're lying in bed or lying on the couch. And that, that, just that, and she'll take my arm often and pull it over. Interesting, little Ellie, our adopted daughter, she takes my hand 
and she'll pull it right up to her, to her chest like this because she wants to be safe. She wants to be protected. God brings his daughter and walks her down the aisle to Adam. And the Lord really brings the woman to the man. And there's some very important observations here, by the way. God brings the woman to the man. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She, ha she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. First thing, God brings the woman to the man. Without doubt, the verse conveys the idea that the institution of marriage is established by God himself. God brings the woman to the man. He's a father walking down the aisle with his bride, with uh, his daughter. There's no mistaking that she is unique and different from Adam. This is the very first Hallmark moment. I'm not into all these Hallmark movies, you know. It's all these white women with straight teeth and they all find one another. Huh? But there is a hallmark moment here. This is the first love poem. Think about this. The first words recorded by a man was not, this is a man's world. No, that was not the first words. The first words were, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Man. So you're allowed to say, by the way, gentlemen, when you first saw your bride, when you first saw, I don't know about you, I... I I don't cry much, but boy, I cried at our wedding. When she walked down the aisle, the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen, you get this, is that, is that moment, I just got goosebumps, or people bumps. Uh, I, uh, you see her and you're like, wow. She takes your breath away. And, and you realize why there's so many love songs that people resonate with? You know, oh, what's his name? Ed Shoring or Shini or Shino? The redhead guy with a little guitar. Sherry, thank you. You know, you look perfect tonight, right? When your heart da, da, did a little, da, what's that song? Uh, and you, uh, da, 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 da. I can't remember the song. My wife has always told me not to sing. But um, what was that song he sings? Because she's like, he'll remember her forever. Come on, ladies. Some of you, like, See, my wife's been to two Ed Sheeran concerts, so she knows. But every song he sings, interesting enough, people know it. It's a big deal. But a lot of love songs is all about me, what you do for me. Isn't that interesting? Not many love songs are about what I do for you, and that's key. The image of shared flesh illustrates the complete bond of marriage. And number four is key. The, and this is, this is interesting. Bruce Walkie actually said this. The equality of man and woman are found in the naming, Adam naming his, his wife woman and also himself man. Because in the Hebrew, they're very similar. Although Adam means ground, Adam names himself in relationship to his wife. A man and a woman are never more like God than on their wedding day when they commit themselves unconditionally to one another. And this is why preparation for marriage is so key. So when you're standing in front of one another, that moment, it, it, it is a mystery. I still remember reading my vows to Renee, she reading her vows to me, and when we said I do and repeated that, there's a mystery there. There's a mystical union that takes place at that moment. Adam understood himself as a husband, and it was a covenant relationship, not a testament, where, where two parties make an exclusive pact with one another. And Jesus, as a greater model of the groom who purchases his bride with his own life and calls husbands to live sacrificial life in love to their wives. So even, if sin, even when sin came into the world, the model is that Jesus is the model. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and didn't feel shamed. This is key. Every marriage is divinely uh, ordained. The inspired explanation aims to correct cultures that give priority to parental bonds over marital bonds. Secure parental bonds lay the foundation for uh, the flip side of that, sorry, is secure parental bonds lay the foundation for secure marital bonds. So a good relationship with a mom and dad sets that safety for children. However, the child leaves mom and dad, and they cleave together, and they become one flesh. 
And that leave is key. The bond of marriage has priority in that all husbands and wives are to be marriage-centered, not parent, and get a hold of this, and not child-centered either. It becomes dangerous when we forget we're married first because when the kids are gone, what do you have? And here's the problem, though. More divorces are taking place as children leave home. Fact. In Christian marriages, by the way. So it was a lie. So then you divorce, and guess what you say to your kids? We actually were living a lie. And so that they then perpetuate that, and they marry a lie. They become a lie. We've got to be careful. They became one flesh. Now, this is where it gets very important. Because physically, sex is the result of oneness. This is key. Sex is the result of the oneness of that covenant relationship. Where a man and a woman say to one another, I will be a mutually exclusive to you based on the values that we have, based upon our walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, and we will connect. So this exclusive relationship, we will wait. So we are exclusive spiritually, cognitively, emotionally, relationally. And the intercourse, the connection on the wedding night, that's pleasurable. But the word intercourse actually is a Latin word that means to run between. So often when you say the word intercourse, people immediately go, oh, sex. No, that's not what the word means. Sexual intercourse is that. But intercourse actually means to run between, to communicate at a spiritual, a cognitive, emotional, a relational, a financial level. So the pleasurable part, the sexual intercourse, makes sense in marriage alone. In the book of Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse, look what it says. There's an exclusive, private, beautiful joining together. Verse 12, a locked garden is my sister, my bride. Why did he call her his sister? Because it was God's daughter. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. It's exclusive. A garden fountain, a well wa living water. Verse 16, blow on my garden. Let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choice fruits. Verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, I came to my God and my sister, my bride. And then God speaks and gives approval in verse 1. Eat, drink, uh, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. God gives two thumbs way, way up. How many times, what word is used four or five times there? The garden. What's that? That's the woman's vagina. Men, when a woman gives herself, Notice what she goes, My, she's exclusive, she's kept herself, and then she gives herself. When a woman gives herself, she gives everything. We do not as men. We do not. They give everything. And he came to his garden. So that, how much more should a woman be not objectified sexually, not used, not touched, and even in marriage? And that's, but it's a beautiful thing. When a woman feels she's safe, secure, attuned to, then she does what? The man enters and the woman does what? Invites. A woman invites. And that's why a woman who's losing it, a woman who is uh, insecure, look at Proverbs 1 to 9. Who gets lured by who? Who lures who there? The woman lures the man. Aha, aha, chapter 7, I have been waiting for you. And I saw a simple man walking down in the dark to the corner of her house, to the adulterous woman, and she jumps out. Aha, aha, I've been waiting for you. My husband's gone away for a whole month. I spread my sheets with, with perfume. Come, let us drink love. That's the word she uses. Let's have, make love. And in chapter 5, do not let your uh, uh, water spill out onto the streets, my son. Always be captivated by your wife. See how the Bible warns that? So that's why a woman can flirt, and that's why a woman can draw in, but a woman who flirts is always looking for an emotional affair. It becomes physical later. A man always enters into a physical affair first. And that's why it says here, the warning, look at the permission that God has given to marriage. Do not forsake this coming together. 
1 Corinthians 7, the man's body is not the man's, but the wife's. The wife's body is not the wife's, but the man's. But the, but the man's. And so you to give oneself over, the only time you stop having sex is really to pray so God will not tempt you. Even after the fall, marriage can somewhat return to Eden. Sexual relationship is not just for procreation, but pleasure continually to be refreshed. Look what God says in 1 Corinthians. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexual, immoral, and adulterous. That is actually in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse, verse 4. Verse 5. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says it is God's will that we are sexually pure. And the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. As long as they were in relationship with God, um, that should say vertically, they should be totally naked horizontally. Sorry, that should be turned around there. As long as they were in relationship with God vertically, horizontally, they could be totally naked. What does that mean? They were authentic. They were real. There was nothing to hide. Nothing to hide. They didn't have to be defensive in any way. And so marriage is made up of this exclusive relationship. And remember, do you have a guaranteed closeness? Do you model sacrificial service to one another? Is there a mutual agreement of defined values that form your relationship and also how you sabotage them? Do you seek to understand the other? Are you available to speak with one another and then together with God? Are you an exclusive base, both men and women, that you can return to and be open and honest, and therefore a safe haven to be open with one another? Do you attune to one another's emotions, or do you run one another down and call one another names? Do you meet the other's needs, and do you persevere with one another when tested. So what I want you to do now, you'll get up and I want you to, just with your spouse, I do want you to be speaking just to your spouse. These times are just between uh, both of you. And I want you to go down some of those characteristics and say which ones are a part of our marriage and which ones are not. And if you want to really focus in on the uh, helper, you know, how have you felt loved and cherished wives? Uh, husbands, how have you felt respected and connected? Talk about that. And again, if you can pray together, I want you to do that. Is there something missing? Are these 10 characteristics, and by the way, they're all in Genesis 1 and 2, do they govern your life? And if they don't, how can you repent together, confess together? All right.